Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're able to make it to our sermon, our website, our teaching today. And uh, we'll conclude the three-part series that we started about the question, original, the original question was, is God sexist? And we talked a lot about that in part one, and then in part two, I hope, as we went through how Yeshua, uh, Jesus, treated women of his day 2,000 years ago. I hope we made it very clear. I hope you're clear about it that no, he, if anything, he was very liberal in terms of the way men treated women in his day. He was well ahead of the curve. And then today I'm going to talk more about uh, our calling as men and women in the functions we have and the relationships we have, especially in marriage, and the war that's going on and what we have to do, what you have to do and I have to do to recognize this war going on against our marriages and the calling we've been given to do something about it. So, is God sexist? Certainly, I hope in that last sermon I showed you that Jesus, Yeshua, certainly is not and uh, continues to live today. And we showed you how he treats women. I say treats because he's alive today. So, hello everybody. I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. It's our free website. And I hope you tell others about it if uh, you, you like what you hear here and you feel you're being fed by it. Today's sermon is a very important sermon because there's so much at stake. I just want to remind everybody what's at stake. Now, 2,000 years ago, Yeshua shattered the taboos of his society about how women were to be treated. He treated them uh, with fairness. He treated them with honor and uh, with kindness and gentleness. He elevated their stature. He met them where they were in their lives. He was kind and gentle even, and yet frank, to the broken people, if I can call it that. Most of us have brokenness in our lives. The woman at the well, he said, yeah, you said rightly that you have no husband for you've had five. And so, I mean, he, he didn't pull his punches, but at the same time, uh, he, he was gentle with them. He let his disciples, uh, he let them join his disciples, be disciples, and learn from him, sit at his feet, just like the men did. He let a woman who'd had seven demons cast out of her, Mary of Magdala, uh, also be a, a leading disciple. And the first witness, the very first human being to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach, was a woman made in the likeness of God. And he praised women in many of his parables. He even met with several who had been bad women, if I can call it that. We've all been bad. We've all been sinners. But the woman caught in adultery. And neither do I condemn you. He started with a statement of no condemnation in spite of the fact You've just been caught in the act of adultery, though they unfairly left the man out there. Neither do I condemn you. And he said, now go and sin no more. Don't keep doing this. And the woman who had had many sins, who wept at his feet and, um, and anointed his feet with her hair and wiped them with the tears from her eyes. And uh, Yeshua said, yes, I know this woman. I know she's a sinner. I know she has many sins. And because her sins are many, she loves much. For to whom much is forgiven, loves much. And so, what a testimony of the way he acted towards women, good and bad, and uh, high, highly regarded women, those not. Women were the ones who also stayed with him at the cross in the final hours of agony. When most of the men, except John, and then John eventually sent away with his mom. But most of the men left him. But the women stayed there to the very end. None of us like to die alone. We just don't. So women, thank you for being there as your sex uh, women, the female sex, being there with him at his time of need, of pain and suffering, of aloneness, of rejection. You did not. You did your best to show not everyone's rejecting you. Meanwhile, some of the men were standing in judgment of him during all of these times. So today in the final part three, I want to remind you of the high calling we've been given as men and women to live out a certain role, a certain function, as husband and wife especially. I alluded to that briefly last time. Let's turn to it again in Ephesians 5, verses 32 and 33. Yeshua had said, uh, I mean, not uh, Paul had been talking about marriage and wives and husbands, and he comes to this point in Ephesians 5, 32, excuse me a second, where he says, but you know what, I'm not really even talking about men and women. I'm not really even talking about marriage between husbands and wives. What I've really been discussing is Christ and his bride, the church. Let's read it in Ephesians 5.32. 
This is a great mystery, but I speak to you concerning Christ and the church. That's really what I'm talking about, he says. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Almost all of my uh, uh, quotes today will be out of the New King James. A couple will be out of the uh, NIV or the uh, Complete Jewish Bible, but primarily from the New King James. If it doesn't say where it's from, it's going to be from the New King James. He says now, he's not even talking about the human marriage, he said. He's depicting a holy union between the Son of God and the church. Our lives are supposed to be depicting that. Our lives are supposed to be bringing glory, glory and honor to our Father, to God Almighty, to Yeshua. Glory and honor, especially in our marriages. He says he's not, okay, in case you haven't noticed, by the way, Satan and, and his evil spirits have gone out on an all-out assault on relationships, on male, on female, on especially uh, correct leadership. Uh, he's instigated divorce after divorce, which God says he hates, Malachi 2.16. You may want to go through that. God himself got divorced after thousands and thousands and thousands of adulteries, physical and spiritual adulteries, worshiping other gods and all the things. He didn't, he didn't divorce Israel right away, but, but he eventually did. And uh, Satan's been attacking sex genders. And God says he hates it. He didn't like going through it. And so Yeshua, who was the, the one who had married Israel, wasn't God the Father. It was Yeshua because Yeshua was the one who died. And Yeshua is the one who's going to be, as we will read, the concerning Christ and the church. And so we, Yeshua died, Romans 7 says, that as because he died, uh, now there's no more bond to that, to that marriage that he had before with Israel. So Satan's been going after all of us. He's been going after our little babies, unborn babies, in abortion, 61 or 62 million in America alone. I meant to bring up those little 12-week-old baby feet, the exact size of typical 12-week-old babies in the womb. 62 million, million. There's some countries that aren't that big who have been killed now because of abortion. He's been going after the male sex gender, the female sex gender. There's no such thing as a sex gender. He tells us through his world, through his society. He's been attacking male leadership, especially white male masculinity, toxic male masculinity. He's been attacking marriage and saying we don't need to be married. We can shack up together. And many, many in the world have been buying into that. And many in the church have been buying into the idea we can divorce, remarry, and all of that. It's not pleasing to God, it's just not. Our relationships, our families, our marriages, in fact, are at the core of what a good relationship should be like, at the core of it. It's what's keeping the church and communities, it's what's keeping our nation together is the family, it's the family unit, the marriage unit. And uh, so I, by the, and I've been attacked too. I've had to work on my marriage. Uh, there are times I'm sure my wife has wondered about divorce in the 45 years we've been married. Let me be honest with you and frank with you. And there are times that I want it out. But at such times, thankfully, God's Holy Spirit to both of us made us get on our knees, repent, apologize to each other, and in prayer recommit to making this marriage a glorious marriage to, to the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. It hasn't always been. So I speak as one who has been in the fight against the attacks we've been having. I speak as one who's had to build and keep protecting and guarding this union God has given us because God wants me to be happily married, my wife to be happily married. I think it's good that we read now and we'll post them on the board here behind us and, uh, and uh, these scriptures will be primarily from the New King James. Let's just read what God says and the joy that he intends for all of us to have. Proverbs 5, verses 18 to 19. Let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. That's what God intends. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you. Don't be looking at anybody else's. Don't be trying to touch anybody else's. I'll speak frankly in this message. 
let her breast satisfy you. Women, you have to let your breast satisfy your husband. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. If any of you don't like what I'm saying, if it's coming straight from Scripture, then you're going to have an issue with God, not with me. Sometimes these verses haven't been preached all that often. Well, we're going to preach them today. Ecclesiastes 9.9, 9, live joyfully with the wife whom you love. Live joyfully with the life who, wife whom you love all the days of your vain life in which is given you under the sun, for that is your portion in life. Your portion is to live joyfully. Bring joy to your wife. That's my goal. I want my wife happy. I really want her happy with our marriage. Um, that was Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. Now, now De Deuteronomy 20, verse 7, God says to Moses, tell the people that if any of you is betrothed, if any of the men are betrothed, and uh, the man have to go to war, but he's not married this woman yet, he says he's, not, he's exempt from the war. Let him go and return, return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man marry her. Look at God's concern. I want you to experience marriage, he's saying. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. When a man has taken a new wife, a new wife, <laughs> he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife. So you see, rejoice with your wife, bring happiness with your wife, to your wife. That's what God intends. Bring happiness to her. That's my goal. This is so important that I'll quote even what Mordecai the cousin to Esther said to her at the time when, uh, uh, when uh, Haman the Agagite was doing all he could to eliminate all Jews, to wipe them out. Ethnic cleansing, uh, just kill them all. And uh, Esther, who was a Jew, but they didn't know she was a Jew, was in the courts, was a, a, a wife of the, uh, of the uh, emperor. And uh, Mordecai says, hey, you can't just sit around there. If, if, let's post it up here, Esther 4, verse 14. He's saying to her, if you don't handle this, surely God will send someone else to handle it. But you, he says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I say to you and I say to me, who's to say you and I were born, put here on this earth at this time? For such a time as this. Satan is on the attack. You and I cannot be asleep. You and I have to rise up and protect our marriages, protect our families like Adam did not. Remember when God told Adam, I'm going to put you into the garden to dress and to keep it. The word keep is often used to also mean to protect it. You're to keep out intruders. You're to protect your wife, protect your family. You and I were born at this time. We're coming under assault from Satan, and we are called to protect what God has given us. We were called to be part of something a lot bigger, something a lot more important than just ourselves. Let's rise to the occasion. Let's stand up for our marriages. Let me say it again. We're born for such a time as this. I believe that two or three or four thousand years from now, posterity will be talking about this generation, your generation and mine, the probably the last generation before Yeshua returns, and talking about how we took on Satan's attacks and we fought back with the Holy Spirit and we won. I'm really, really clear that's going to happen, that they'll be talking about whether we failed or whether we won. We've been called to fight Satan, to fight back, to put on the armor of God, to fight for and depend, uh, defend the sacred union he's called us to in our, and the, the very union that you and I covenanted before witnesses, that we covenanted before our very God in heaven and said that we will be faithful and love and protect until the day we die as long as we are, are alive. And if we've broken that covenant in different ways, like unfaithfulness, infidelity, or anything else, then repent of it, but get back and fight for that marriage. 
When we put on the armor of God, he who is with us is greater than he who is in the world. And we go on the attack against the gates of hell. Remember what Yeshua said. And he said, I will build my church. And he says, and the gates of the grave of Hades, of hell, shall not prevail. Gates don't attack. Gates defend. That means we go on the attack against the gates of hell, and they shall not prevail with God's Holy Spirit. Wake up, folks. We can't be sitting quietly by while abortion's going on, while attacks on marriages is going on. We can't be standing by, just sitting by, idly saying nothing, doing nothing. While our own marriage starts disintegrating. Wake up, all of us. Me, too. I'm always preaching to myself. You know that. Satan's kingdom wants to tell you that God's word's out of date. It's not woke, whatever that means. It's not with the times. It's sexist by saying that the husband, for example, is head of the wife and we are to serve one another. It's sexist by saying a wife is supposed to submit to her husband as she would to Jesus Christ himself. It's sexist, they say, to love as Christ does, give, give, uh, does and giving yourself to your wife. And too many of you bought into the counterattacks from the world's conclusions that the Bible is sexist. And so many of our ministers aren't even preaching the verses and scriptures we're reading today. I don't care. I know from the example I gave in part two that the way Yeshua treated women absolutely shows he was not and is not sexist. And I know what God's word says, that we are all you know, one with him. There's no partiality. I believe God. There's no partiality with him. And I could give a hoot what Satan's kingdom defines as sexist. We're not part of that kingdom. Don't even listen to it. We're part of the kingdom of heaven. We're part of the kingdom ruled by holy, mighty, holy, holy, holy God Almighty and his son, the word, the, the, our savior. God's word says he's not partial to anyone, men or women. We're all one in Christ. We all have the same salvation. We're heirs together of the grace of life. That's what I believe. And the kingdom of God uh, hands out awards when that happens. I think many of us will be amazed at how many who are now women in this life will be handed very, very big rewards if, if they lived out their function the way the Bible says and if we men lived out our functions the way the Bible said leading as Christ does his church. But any who refuse to live out their own functions, they might be in trouble as far as rewards go. They might be there as far as salvation goes, but I don't know how much of a reward they'll have. So by the world standards, yeah, they might call it sexist. They might call God sexist, but I don't care. And all of us are being called to be part of God's family. The, the marriage that we're being called to is such a holy one. And so let's not be caring about the way the world thinks. Frankly, our lives are meaningless unless and until every one of us submits to the function God's called us to. And unless every one of us believes him, really believes him in our hearts and trusts that he's telling us the right things. So women of God have to comport their thinking to what God says about women, and we men have to comport our thinking to our functions and to the love and the gentleness God calls us to as well. So my goal is to make it clear that we're in the fight of our lives. That's why I'm spending three sermons on this. To win back the correct perspective on male-female relationships. If Satan can get us all thinking that God really is sexist or really doesn't like women as much or favors men, then he's successfully attacking the very foundation of our society and of our human relationships and of the kingdom of God. Too many no longer fight for their marriages. Our fight, frankly, is often done on our knees, beseeching God for his Holy Spirit to activate inside of us, rebuking the inroad Satan has made in our lives. I remember counseling a, a couple one time, <coughs> in a marriage counseling years ago. I was in their home, I'm sitting on the couch, and there's a, a coffee table in front of us. And as they were describing and attacking each other, and how bad the other one was, I just sat quietly for a while and then I said, you know what I see? As I look around the carpet here and I look around the floor, I see muddy footprints all over the place. The wife looked up like, what do you mean muddy footprints? I see the footprints, spiritual footprints 
of Satan right in the middle of all of this. You guys are playing right into his hands. I looked at the man and I said, you are supposed to love your wife. It doesn't say if she submits to you, if she's nice, if she's loving. You are to love your wife. And you are to give yourself for her. And you are to honor her, Peter says. And to the wife, I said, you are to be submissive to your husband and respect him. It doesn't say if he's a good husband. I said, go back and read 1 Peter 3. It starts by saying, likewise, you wives. What does he mean by likewise? Go back to 1 Peter 2 and go back and look at the context. It's about how Yeshua submitted to what he had to go through in spite of very, very painful consequences of that at the time. Faith. Faith in God. So we have to fight for our marriages. And as children of God, we're tasked with representing that ultimate marriage of Christ and his church, like I've been saying. He says he's not even talking. He's saying this is a mystery. Are we going to fulfill our task? And 1 Corinthians 10.31, let's read that. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Paul says, my life should be bringing glory to God. I, I shamefully admit it hasn't always done that. But going forward, I certainly hope and pray that my life going forward is going to bring glory to God and to what he says. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Remember John the Baptist said in uh, John 3, verse 30, that he, Christ, must increase and I must decrease? That's the point here. We, the world and the people around us, our husbands, our wives, our children, everyone around us should be seeing more and more of the glory of, of Yeshua shining out from us and less and less of the old me. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I died. I no longer live. I died. And the life I live, I now live by the faith in Christ and the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I want him to be living in me. I want the life that I now living. It's not the old Paul, but the new Yeshua living inside of me. People should see our marriages. People should see my life as praising God, as an honor to God. Your marriage should be seen that way. And think of this too. The early disciples could claim, and often did claim, we are witnesses that he rose again, that Yeshua lives. Do you know, I'll give a whole sermon sometime on this one little point I'm going to just touch on. Do you know you and I have also been called to be witnesses? By the way, in the Greek, the word for wit witness comes from the root word for martyr. Okay, it's because so many of the witnesses died for being a witness. But how can I witness to the resurrection of Yeshua? How can you witness to the resurrection of Yeshua? You know what it is? By them seeing the risen Christ. They must look at me and look at you and eventually say, this is a different man than I used to know. Far away from that so far still, but I want to get there. I want people to be able to look at you, look at me and say, he is a witness that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, lives. Because I see him living in you, living in me. Our lives should be living witnesses to the risen Messiah. So this has to be happening in our marriages. Our marriages have to be bringing glory to God too. Uh, we witness to the risen Christ by them seeing that we are a testimony that he lives. So anyway, last time we covered a lot. We covered there's no male or female as far as uh, and God says in the church, Galatians 3.28. God says he made them two sexes, male and female, but as far as in the church, we're all one. Uh, Peter says we're heirs together. The concept of together is very strong all the way through the Bible. Uh, they were to rule over the earth together. Let them have dominion. And I likened it to a beautiful, perfectly matched championship dance couple on the world stage in competition. The man leads in a dance and the woman follows. But you don't see the man whipping her around, hollering at her and all this. No, no, you see the man, you don't even notice how he's leading or whatever, but they work together. 
in perfect harmony. And uh, the woman's giving her input as well, the, the, the partner, uh, the woman partner. And for example, when my wife and I dance, so one of the times we recently went for a dance, she said, honey, can you take smaller steps on the turn? She just kind of whispered that in my ear. So I whispered back, of course I will, sweetheart, and took smaller steps. So you're listening to each other. You're honoring each other. You're submitting to each other. I want to read a scripture that I'll bet hasn't been read in your church for a long time. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 9 to 12. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Verse 10, for this reason a woman ought to have the symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Verse 11, nevertheless, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 11 now, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman. You can't be going out on your own, man. Come on, you, you, you need the women. You need your wife. Nor woman independent of the man. And the same word that they use for woman or man, many, many places was the same word they use for wife or husband. Neither is the wife independent of her husband in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. We're born, all of us men are here because of women. And if, us, if we men had to be responsible for giving birth, having children, I think the human race would have uh, ended long ago. So thank you, women, for that. But woman came from man. The original woman came out of the body of man. And then every man since then has come out of the body of women. Except Adam. So it makes me wonder if Adam had an umbilical cord. You know, uh, umbilical uh, belly button, you know. So many scriptures make it plain that God shows no favoritism. Both men and women were created equally in God's likeness. Both men and women look like God even though he's portrayed primarily as father, as he, as, as a male, uh, I really, truly don't believe, as I've explained before, I really, truly, in a spirit form, I don't believe God has spiritual male sex organs or female sex organs. But what makes us look like God is we have a head and shoulders and arms and a torso and a belly and, and two legs and so on, and, and, and designed in such a way that we, when, if we stood next to God the Father or Yeshua, if they turned their brilliance down, I think uh, you'd say, yeah, there's a resemblance there. I can see that we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. 1 and 2 especially. And I think we look of God as having so many masculine traits where it, it says his voice is like the sound of many thunders or as many waters. We think of his strength and his power and the lightnings and the earthquakes. And that's kind of what Elijah was looking for. Remember when he, when he uh, fled to Horeb, to Mount Sinai? And he was looking for God in these big, loud, big events that depicted masculinity. But maybe Elijah was also being taught, you know what? Women also depict me. I have so-called female traits as well. And such as speaking gently and softly in a whisper, as he did to Elijah in the cave. He wasn't expecting that. But that's more the feminine side, the forgiveness, the listening, the understanding, the holding one who's hurting, the nurturing. God sent an angel to feed him and give him food and water and to be there with him. Just more of a female kind of a thing. And so we all depict God. Men and women all do. God intended husbands and wives to share their lives together. God intended women to be the azer, the, the help meet, that's not a bad thing. Because God, and I'll put it in my notes, in many, many scriptures, God is called our helper, our help meet, our azer. In fact, uh, Moses called one of his children Eliezer. And he said it was because God of his fathers has been his help, has been his azer, has been his help meet. So that's not a bad thing. And I'm supposed to help my wife. And she's supposed to help me. We're doing all this together. Remember, go down to Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. And in a couple seconds, we'll post it up here to, uh, so you can see it as I'm talking. Before the section comes about husbands and wives, Ephesians 5, let's review this too. That Jesus called them to himself. They were arguing which one would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus called them to himself. You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over the ones they're ruling over them. 
And those who are great, oh, they love to exercise authority. They like to show who's boss. Some of us men get that way. I've gotten that way more than a few times in my marriage. It doesn't go over well, men. I call rank, or you pull rank and all that. They love to show authority. I'm in charge here. I'm the head of the house. Do what I said. You're supposed, you're supposed to submit. Don't ever talk like that, man. That's just not really what it's supposed to be. Verse 26, yet it shall not be so. Don't be trying to exercise your authority. It shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great, I'm in verse 26, among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If onlookers who knew your family well, maybe your own children, were asked who does the most serving in this household, would they say, oh, it's dad, hands down, or would they say it's mom? I think most of us husbands know, although we would say, well, we serve by bringing in the, bring in the money, and the wives are out there bringing in the money now too, but who, who, who cleans up, who cooks, who sweeps, who makes the beds, who picks up the dirty socks? We husbands should honor our wives by truly listening. That's what Yeshua does to his wife. That's what prayer is all about. He's listening to us as we make our requests may be made known to God, like Paul says in Philippians, uh, is it 4, verse 6 or 7, somewhere in there. And then the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, shall come upon us. So we've got to learn to listen. We've got to learn to love the way Yeshua loves. Let's read this about the man. Ephesians 5, verse 25. I want to start with the man this time. Husbands, love your wives. Love them. Love them the way they want to be loved. The way they feel that they're being loved. Not the way you think you, you need to show love, but the way she would love to be loved. You might have to ask her what would make you feel loved and see what she says. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word and present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. If your wife feels loved and you're loving her, it's going to come back in spades back to us men. It really is. And uh, love is what's focused on here. Some men have a really hard time uh, saying, I love you, showing love, being gentle. I remember a couple, again, going back many years, and again, a different couple than the other one, and, and the woman said to me with the husband there that I don't know if my husband loves me because I have never heard him say, sweetheart, I love you. So I looked at the man and I said, can you tell her you love her? And he says, well, obviously I do because, well, just because. Can you say, sweetheart, I love you? And he says, well, why? Is she blind? She can't see that I, I'm doing the things? Can you say, sweetheart, I love you? He couldn't. He really couldn't. At the same time, we have to learn to love the way the other feels loved. Some women love when you bring flowers, not just on special occasions, but just for no, no real reason. They love that. But not all women do. I know women who would say, why did you waste your money on that? It'll all be wilted in two or three days anyway. How much did you spend on that? $34? $14? Whatever. Why did you waste your money on it? So you got to find out what makes your wife feel loved. Some wives love being cuddled and hugged and held closely. Other women aren't particular to that so much, or maybe it's because we're not doing it in a way that makes them feel like they like it. <laughs> Most wives will feel very loved, I think, if the husband is very kind to them. If the husband listens to them like Christ listens to us when we speak. He doesn't interrupt us, considers their opinions, considers our prayers, answers our prayers, listens to them. Sometimes he says no, but he always listens. And I think women will love a husband who's living gently with them, not hollering at them, not slapping them around. Certainly not. 
even as you protect and serve her needs. Am I right, women? I'm still learning some of these things 45 years later. My wife and I are not very compatible, by the way. We're very, very different. But I had a big, what's the word for it? Um, it was just in my head, but a, a big aha moment when I realized I didn't want to marry myself. I wanted to marry someone who wasn't just like me so that if, if my wife thought exactly like me and would do everything exactly like me, why would I need her? <laughs> so by by me thinking, hey, let's do this, my wife saying, have you considered such and such? Instead of resenting that she didn't immediately get behind me and support what I was saying, I now see that as, yeah, I didn't think of that, or I did think of that, but let's talk about that. And now we're getting a more complete picture. I will say to us men, if your wife says, I, I'm getting a feeling that that's not such a great idea, or, or we shouldn't go out to these people, or that guy, I don't trust him, or that woman, I don't trust her. Listen to your wife. Listen to your wife. A lot of, a lot of women have a real good sense of that. Go to Matthew, uh, well, we read that already, didn't we? Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. I think we read that already, yeah. That we shall not be lording it over and all of that. And so Yeshua was te teaching us that, hey, I love my wife by giving myself to her, serving her, getting down on my feet, serving her. And he also told us men in Matthew 5, 27, 28, quit lusting after women. Quit having wrong thoughts. And uh, that's in Matthew 5, verses 27 to 28. If you look so, so much as look upon a woman with less than your heart, he says, you have just as well have committed adultery with her. Now, how many of us men and many of you women, how many of us could honestly say we've never done that? In God's eyes, that's like, hey, you're thinking it through and eventually given the opportunity, you would hop in bed with that person like that. So he says, don't be doing that. Here's a, a singles ad that was printed once in the Atlanta Journal. Listen carefully. Well, maybe I can post it up here while I'm speaking, the, the ad. Single, young black female seeks male companionship. Ethnicity unimportant. I'm a very good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, riding in your pickup truck, hunting, camping, fishing trips, cozy winter nights, lying by the fire. Wow. Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. I'll be at the front door when you come home from work, wearing only what nature gave me. <laughs> Call, then there's a phone number, and ask for Daisy. Well, about 15,000 men found themselves talking to the Atlanta Humane Society about an eight-week-old black Labrador puppy. <laughs> ah, but that sounded pretty good to a lot of guys. I'll be at the front door when you get home from work wearing only what nature gave me. Wow. I thought that was funny. I hope you do, too. Uh, men, let's do our best to make our lives, our wives have an easier life. To, let's make it easier on our wives to submit to us. Uh, it's so much easier to submit to someone who is kind and gentle and listening and honors you. So many women uh, uh, complain that their husbands just won't listen. Turn now to Proverbs 31. Here's a, a comment about the husband. Proverbs 31, verses 28 to 31. We think of the Proverbs 31 as being the Proverbs 31 wife. Look what it says here about the kids and her husband. Her husband. Proverbs 31, 28 to 31. Her children rise up and call her blessed, call her happy and blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. When's the last time in front of other people or two other people, with or without your wife around, you praised your wife? When was the last time, guys? Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. You're the best. You're the best. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. We all get old. After you've had a few kids, you're not, you don't look like the, the way you did when you were 17 or 25 or 30. But a woman who fears Jehovah, she shall be praised. A woman who fears Jehovah, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of your hands, her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. 
Are we the kind of man who praises and honors and loves and assures our wife? Are we the kind of man, like Song of Solomon, known better as Song of Songs in the Hebrew, uh, Shirim HaShirim, a Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he assures her that she is beautiful to him. She's thinking, no, I've been out there, I've gotten too dark from being out in the sun and working hard with my hands. He says, beloved, I, my, my, I, you're, 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 you're lovely to me. Song of Songs, 1, verses 15, 16. And the whole purpose of Yeshua's husband to the church is that he's looking for ways to make her shine, that he might present her to himself without spot or blemish. And where we do have blemishes, he says, don't worry, I will be your covering. I'll cover for you. I'm going to give you my righteousness. I have a whole series of sermons on, on how God's righteousness is ours by faith. Like Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11 says, Paul says, I don't want the righteousness which comes from keeping the law on my own. I don't want that. Many of you resent that. Many of you reject that. It's in the Bible. He says, what I want is the righteousness that comes by faith, through faith in Yeshua as a gift from God that he gives me, like it says in Romans, all through Romans 5, all through the end of Romans 3, all through the end of Romans 9. And Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11, that's the kind of husband I'm supposed to be to my wife that I cover for her, that I don't have to say, honey, you forgot to bring the napkins, or you forgot to do this, or why did you forget to do that, or why did you slip up here or there, like so many of us husbands do. We've got to stop it. Just got to stop it. We've got to start just listening to each other, mostly let her talk. I love to spend the evenings, in the last 30 minutes or so before we go to bed, we go sit out in the lanai. It's cooler. We can hear the, the crickets are chirping. The cicadas are, you know, making their sound, mostly crickets at night. And uh, she loves that. She loves the little sounds and the sounds of nature and the wind. And we're sitting out there in the lanai of our Florida home. And she really opens up. I love to listen to my wife, to my bride. Um, and I know, she, she, she's remarked many times, I just love it when we can do that. And sometimes we'll go for these long walks together, and I try my best to let her even vent if she needs to, but, but speak. Now, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, out of the uh, complete Jewish Bible, you husbands likewise conduct your married lives with understanding. You have to understand one woman. You don't have to understand all women, just your wife. And uh, respect her. Honor her, giving her honor and respect as fellow heir of the gift of life, even though she's weaker physically. So also remember, men, you are the head of the family. You don't have to make a big deal of it. You don't have to call out, but do lead. Do lead. Ask her opinion and do lead. Women, let your husbands lead. Do step back a little bit. Let them lead. Don't follow the... I find it hard to find any humor in what you see in commercials and sitcoms and movies. I don't even watch them anymore. What do we see? We, we, we hear the dad, we see the father, we see the husband constantly being made to look stupid. That is not of God. Don't, don't laugh at that. Don't be even putting that, be putting that into your head. It will desensitize you. It will make you feel and think the wrong things. Men lead, protect, gently lead, and step up and fight for your marriage and love your wife as Christ loved the church, giving himself for her and not finding fault with the wife, but covering her so there's no spot or wrinkle as she calls out for you to be merciful in that she dropped something here or there, forgot to pick up something you asked her to pick up or whatever at the store. Gentle leading. Wives will submit easier to that. Wives, don't you, don't you agree? Let's read a bunch of scriptures now about wives. Proverbs 12, verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. Proverbs 18.22, the NIV. He who finds a wife finds what's good, finds a good thing, and receives favor from Jehovah. Proverbs 19, verse 13, NIV again. A foolish son is his father's ruin. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. You know how you're lying there in bed and you hear the tap, 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 tap. You had to close the faucet all the way. Or you try to close it and it's 
Something's got to be repaired. Tap, 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 tap. A quarrelsome wife just gets on your nerves. He says it's like constant dripping. He had a thousand concubines and wives. He had a lot of dripping going on, I'll guarantee you. Don't envy him, men. Proverbs 19, 14. Houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but a prudent wife is from Yehovah. A prudent wife, a wonderful wife, is from God. Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 24. First of all, remember that instead of starting at Ephesians 5, 22, Ephesians 5, 21 says, I think I skipped over that earlier in my notes, uh, it says, submit yourselves to one another. So yes, we're supposed to submit ourselves to one another. God even told Abraham, submit to what, is, to what Sarah is asking you to do, to get rid of Hagar. That's of me. That's in Genesis 21, I believe, around verse 12 or so. Maybe they can post it up here real quick. God says, listen to Sarah. Do what she says, because that's from me. So, um, wives, submit to your own husbands. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, the New King James. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, or as I like to say, as you would to Jesus Christ himself. That's what it's saying. That's tough, but it's also tough, ladies, for us to love our wives, us men, to, we men, to love our wives like Christ loved the church, giving himself for her and finding not a spot or wrinkle. That's really tough, too, really tough. So we both have really high callings to, to, to listen to. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. You don't dare find a church arguing back with him and fighting him, screaming at him. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let wives be to their own husbands in everything. I'm not going to apologize for that scripture. I'm not going to apologize by not ever talking about it either. Too many of you ministers no longer read these verses because you're afraid of what the women in your congregation will say. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 6. It's time we read these verses. Stand up, take the part we've been called to play, and fight for our marriages by living the lives and the functions God's given us. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. You don't have to be submissive to me, but to your own husband, yes. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. In this thing of submitting to your own husbands, one time I had my wife ask her to please go pick up so-and-so, a man, at some place for some church activity. My wife was driving our car. And when, it, when she got there, this is like 30, 40 years ago, when, so maybe things would be different today, but she, when she got there, the man says, I'm not getting in a car being driven by a woman. And my wife said, uh, well, this is my car, our car, and I'm driving. So if you want to get back to the activity, hop in. If you won't let me drive, then I guess you're not going. And he says, I'm not getting in unless you get out and let me drive the car. My wife said goodbye and took off. <laughs> she didn't have to submit to someone else's husband. And uh, I laughed at that. I talked to him later. I said, that was really dumb. You had a long walk because, you, because of your vanity. And your, the Bible says submit to one another, Jeff. I, that wasn't his name. It's no Jeff out there that I'm referring to. But I just made that up as a, as a name. But anyway, you just, you know, you, 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 you're going overboard. She has to submit to me. She doesn't have to submit to you. Anyway, anyway, be submissive to your own husbands. Back to 1 Peter 3, verse 3 says, Don't, don't focus on outward beauty, uh, the hair, the wearing of gold, the, the, the great clothing. Let your beauty, verse 4, be the hidden spirit, the, the hidden person of the heart. God says, I'm more interested in a beautiful heart than I am in a beautiful hairdo or the latest outfit. I, I, I'm looking at a beautiful heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Women, that's what you've been called to. That's what you've got to surrender to. That's what you've got to obey. For in this manner in former times, holy women who trusted in God, 
adorned themselves, how by the beautiful heart, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I think that's back in Genesis 18 or so, somewhere in there where God is saying to Abraham that they're going to have a, a child, and she kind of laughed in the back room. And shall I have pleasure with my Lord? She called Abraham his, her Lord. Kind of like saying sir or something like that today. I'm not asking my wife to ever call me sir. Yes, sir, or whatever. But that's what he's implying here, that please, that's what Sarah did. Whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid. He, he didn't apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize for that. I spoke strongly to the men. I speak strongly to the women. Go back now to verse 1. Peter says, likewise. Go back to the end of chapter 2 and see what he's referring to as likewise. He's talking to servants who have to submit to their masters, both the kind and the cruel. He's talking to about Yeshua, who submitted to all the things he had to submit to, including the beatings and everything he went through, because that's what God had called him to go through. And so when he says likewise, he says sometimes it'll be hard to submit to a husband who's a little bit or a lot unconverted, who is not a part of even the church. In the godly marriage and union, we see over and over again the concept of togetherness. Work it out together like the dance couple. And even if you're with a, a believer who, I mean, with a husband who's not a believer, 1 Corinthians 7, you can go back and read it in there. If he's willing to depart, let him depart. But if he's willing and, and happy to stay with you, let him stay with you. You be the kind of wife. Keep your marriage together, it says in 1 Corinthians 7. Because otherwise, for the children's sake, he's saying your children are holy because of you, the one with God's Holy Spirit. Your husband is in a holy position because of you, the wife with the Holy Spirit. Go back and read that. I meant to put that in here, but running out of time. And I just hate it when a group of married couples or men and women, and we see them joking around about each other, and pretty soon the, the wife says something mean with a little bit of a laugh about her husband. Ha ah, ha ha, how stupid, how stupid. How, I think it's disrespectful. Or when the wife is then derided and criticized and ridiculed by the husband in front of others, I think it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. That's not being obedient to bring honor to the wife. We husbands have to trust our wives, too. The, the, in the uh, Proverbs 31 woman, it says her husband trusts her. Proverbs 31, verse 11 and 12. Trust her. She does him good and not evil all the days of his life. Proverbs 31, verse 11. That's what I just read. Verse 11. And when you go to Proverbs 31, you wives want to read that over and over again. This is a woman, a wife, who is busy. Who is busy. I think it depicts the church. And I think the husband depicts Christ. And they're busy. They're active. They're the wife of valor. That's really what the meaning of, of, uh, of uh, the Proverbs 31 uh, wife. Virtuous. The word virtuous really means valor. Look it up. And look how, how other ways that word is used. It's talking about the, the great men of valor in, in the armies. <laughs> she's not lazy. She's busy. She buys, uh, she buys property, plants a vineyard. So our, our husband is the vine in our vineyard. I'm the vine, you are the branches, he says. She's investing herself in the kingdom of God. And her husband trusts her. So once again, Yeshua is the example not only of, of the men leading properly, but he's also the example for you wives and women on how he submitted so perfectly. I mean, he completely submitted. No one's asking wives to submit to the degree that Christ did. When he said, not a single word I'm saying, not a single thing I'm doing, not a single work that you see me doing is from me, but I'm doing the works of my Father. The words you hear are not my words, but the Father's words. I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm not here to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All these verses about his total submission, which is really a total perfect example for you wives as well. Let me say again, we both are to submit to our head, Jesus Christ. And look how Christ submitted to his head, the Father, perfectly. I really believe, men, you, women, you, none of us will be totally happy about being in our roles as man and woman or husband or wife or happily married 
until we and unless we trust God, like Peter said to women, like women of old who trusted in God, it applies to those men as well. We might have a wife who is not very submissive, who is hard to love. You gotta love her anyway. God tells us to love our enemies. God loved us. Christ loved us. Romans 5, between verses 8 and 10, somewhere in there. He loved us while we were yet sinners. While he's up there on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The poor guy is in terrific, excruciating pain. Forgive them. They know not what they do. We will not be happy until we trust God, until we do our roles given to us by God, until we act and live the way we're supposed to live, until we get in the fight and fight Satan, realize we're in the fight of our lives, get up and protect our marriages, repent. If you're already divorced, then repent, move on. If you're not divorced yet, fight for your marriage. I don't think this is being preached a lot out there, what I've been, the verses I've been reading you. Pastors, I think, are afraid to preach this. But we have been called for such a time as this. We've been born and lived for such a time as this. Fulfill your calling. Stand up. Don't be late to see and wake up. Become zealous for everything, including your relationships with men and women and with husbands and wives. I don't care, again, the world says God is, the Bible is sexist and those who live by it are sexist. I will live by this word. I will love my wife. I will lead my wife. I will submit to her at times. She will submit to me. I will more and more try to find the good in everything about her. Without spot or wrinkle, I will more and more live to live like Christ did, to giving myself for her, asking what is important to her, asking how I can help her, and then leading as well, protecting as well. And my wife is devoted at this point anyway. We could, if we stop praying and stop seeking God, we can all go the other way. My wife as well is committed to doing her role, to love me, respect me, honor me, submit to me. I'm not easy to submit to all the time. But she knows her role is to submit. And she's not always submissive to me. My role is still to love her. I think she's a terrific woman, very wise, intelligent woman. Together we complement each other terrifically. If I remember to look at it that way, instead of seeing it as a contrast or not getting in with me, I, I'm in the fight with all the rest of you to make our marriage be what it should be and to rebuke Satan. So with that in mind, let's ask God's blessing. Our Father in heaven, holy, holy, holy Father in heaven, and Yeshua, our Savior, our husband, we repent of falling so far short of the high calling you've given us. We want to wake up. We don't want to be laid to sin. We want to obey you. We want to submit to you. We want to do what you've called us to do, regardless of what anyone else is doing. We want to bring you glory and honor in our marriages and in our lives. We repent of all the ways we've failed to do that until now, including me, Father. We repent and we look up to you. We want to look more and more like Yeshua. We want people to see him growing in us and we getting less and less. And let the women look more and more like Yeshua. Let the men look more and more like Yeshua. Father in heaven, we lift up our hands and praise you and honor you and we ask you to come and lead us. Yeshua, come and be our leader in this fight. Help us put on the armor and go into battle against Satan and his armies, against Satan and his spirits in high places. And rebuke him in our marriages, rebuke him in our lives. And stand up 
And remember, you put us here for a reason, and we count on that, Lord God in heaven. Help us love you by obeying your word. Help us love you by seeing how much we've been forgiven. Help us to love you by letting you grow in us and bringing you glory and honor and not shame. We repent of any shame that I and others have brought to you at various times in our lives. We don't want that anymore. So we submit to you, Yeshua, our King and our Savior. We submit to you, Father, Holy, Holy, Holy Father. Help us be holy, for you are holy. Come and live in us and shine upon us. Thank you. Thank you for our spouse. Thank you for our people in our lives. Thank you for our families. Thank you for your high calling. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.